Hi, I'm Rich Wynn. And I'm Rebecca Nixon. And this is the PropTech Growth Podcast. Every episode, we interview an expert in the PropTech startup space, gathering their advice and expertise to help you run a successful PropTech business. I'm the portable PropTech CMO, and I help PropTech startups build and scale their commercial growth strategy. I'm Rich from Richwin Consultancy. I specialize in operations, sales, and process, helping fintechs and prop tech companies to grow. Thank you very much for having me as a guest on the show. My, my name is Ken Valady. I'm a co-founder and partner at a company called Progressive Acceleration. My, my background is marketing. So in days gone by, I was a brand marketeer. Now I, with Progressive, now with Progressive, I, I'm like a, a person in the middle. So we sit, the company sits between large corporates, such as the P&Gs, the Mercedes, GSKs of this world, and the startup ecosystems. So in essence, we get briefs from the corporate world and it could be any kind of challenge they have. It could be a marketing challenge, a procurement challenge, a recruitment challenge, an ESG um, challenge. We take that brief. We go searching with the networks we've built over the last nine years. We go searching across the global startup ecosystems, and we come back to our client with uh, a lie of the land, what people are doing, and most importantly, what startups, scale-ups are doing in this space around their brief. And the goal is to not only bring our clients up to speed with the art of the possible, but as importantly, to help our clients narrow that field of say 40 or 50 companies down to five, then down to one. And that one or two sometimes is the startup that they choose to do a paid pilot with. So we go from a brief, which is sometimes deemed as impossible to solve to the actual corporate client working with one or two startups. And we go through pitch sessions and everything, but that's the long and short of the main service that we offer. I did it initially on my own when I jumped the corporate ship nine years ago, but as I say, I now co-founder a a larger agency that do it, does this. It's great. So we understand that you have a book. I do, yes. I want to hear a bit about your book before I ask you any more questions about what you're doing. Yeah, so the the book was one of those things that when I first jumped the corporate ship, uh, as I say, nine years ago now, there was a lot of startup and investor lingo and language that was being thrown at me run roadmap run rate burn rate convertible notes series abc and from someone who came from a, a corporate background it it was it overwhelmed you it's like oh my goodness i don't understand the language these people are speaking i'm trying to be credible the person in the middle and one of the biggest challenges was i actually don't understand what people are talking about now to a certain extent, being a brand person being slightly egotistical and having a having an ego should we say and a bit of pride i winged it I'm not suggesting you should all do that, but I winged it and looked after the meeting as to what the, the words meant. But as time went on, these words picked up. And and then literally uh, two years ago, I thought there's a good opportunity to bring a book out, which goes through the 200 plus terms that startups and investors use. So we've got a book, an A to Z, 200 plus terms, the main definitions behind these terms, and also stories, individual stories from 25 30 experts behind certain words and terms and the book's called startup lexicon plug for the book there we go and it's 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 really if i'm honest it's a bit of marketing it helps with what we do at progressive but it was also a personal thing to see if i did have a book in me i wrote it with a a lovely guy called Eamon kerry who up to recently headed up textiles in the uk and and we pulled it together and without Eamon, i think i'd still be thinking about it now so two of us did it and it came out last june and it's good fun. I'd recommend it to anyone to, to have a go at putting a book together and see where it takes you. It does have a life of its own. But yes, that's the book. It's like, a, would say, a philosophy of terms or a lexicon for people who want to work with startups or, or are thinking of starting in their own business or maybe they're studying the subject. I work with a lot of prop tech startup founders. That's my bread and butter. And I would say 50% of them will have to check in with me about terms and Coming from a startup background myself, I use these terms and often it's so typical. You get ingrained with certain language and you just use it and then you don't realise that other people don't necessarily naturally know that. And so quite often I'll be having a a conversation with prop tech startup founder and they'll pause me and they'll say, oh, sorry, what do you mean by TAM? What do you mean by ROI even? Or what do you mean by runway? And these are people who have businesses Mm. and because they haven't worked in the startup space before, it's all new to them. Mm. They could have 15, 20, even 30 years of property experience. They've felt the pain of a problem and they're going 
into the startup space to solve that problem for their industry. So I think a book like this is incredibly helpful. There's so many terms that get bandied about, particularly if you're going to get investment. There's a number of different terms that an investor is going to ask you about when you pitch to them. They're going to ask you, yeah, a a lot of um, questions that will just sound like a bunch of garbled acronyms to the uninitiated. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that founders are empowered to go into those conversations. Very true. I think there's two things that came out from writing the book after it launched. One was we got a lot of founders who came to us and said that they felt language almost stopped them or lack of understanding of language almost stopped them pushing forward and running their own starting their own business so they they had great business brains great business ideas but they sat down in a certain meeting with investors or co-founders other founders their peers and felt a little bit out of their depth because of some of the terminology and they felt a bit imposter syndrome started to appear and and they were quite close to deciding that the startup world wasn't for them and i'm not saying the book's been a savior in that way but it just highlighted that sometimes small things like understanding one or two phrases can be the difference that makes a person decide to go ahead and go into the world of being an entrepreneur and and not and, and standing back and maybe regretting it later on in life so it is that kind of it can be that deal breaker the confidence of understanding words can be the deal breaker the other thing i kind of reference it to is and i'm i'm older than yourself, Rebecca, but in days gone by, the wine industry in the UK was predominantly for wine connoisseurs. And I felt language got in the way there, but the wine industry did a really good job of making people feel comfortable if they understand a few terms. So in days gone by, if you understood a certain grape, a certain wine, and you had a good experience with the wine, you could sit in a conversation with someone and talk about wine. And that conversation would would flow, excuse the pun, and you'd get into it and you'd feel comfortable. The same is with the, the, the startup terms. If you understand two or three terms that you can get you in the conversation and people feel comfortable with you there by saying, oh, they know what they're talking about, that can lead to really positive outcomes. But it's, it's just knowing a handful of words at the start that give you the confidence to stay at the table and, and have a discussion with someone. And hopefully the book helps give you that repertoire of, of words to kick it off and to feel comfortable at the table. Yeah, and confidence is key. It's something that I talk to a lot of Um, founders about particularly being a woman in business um, or if you are from a different socioeconomic background or if you're like me you grew up in a different country and there's a lot of gaps in confidence that can be based on day-to-day interactions with people in a certain kind of business those gaps are filled naturally by people who come up a certain way but if you don't have that Mm. there's all these stepping stones you've missed out and you feel a bit out of the loop and that can really diminish your confidence despite the fact that your capability may be just as high as anybody else's or even higher so i really like the idea that there's a resource there available to help with that confidence i wanted to ask you a bit about carrying on from the sort of confidence piece Mm. a huge part of being a, a founder is in the pitch how you present your solution whether it's to investors or potential clients Mm. I would love to hear more from you about the pitch and about um, the insight and value that you can give to people around that process yes we've addressed say 100 plus briefs from large corporations so predominantly brands and that means we've been lucky enough to sit in hundreds of pitches and I think the key insights I've acquired over time one is I think preparing for the pitch sometimes gets forgotten mm-hmm. i think people feel that preparing for a pitch is is going through the rehearsals of your slides and everything that is actually part of it but the other part is understanding your audience and and looking into the company you're pitching to and i'm not talking about 10 hours five days worth of heavy research just general stuff about you know what the brand or company doing at the moment what kind of words and phrases they use if you're you know without stalking someone if you're presenting someone predominantly I say it's a brand manager you can check on LinkedIn you know what their background is just do a little bit of research so when you go into that meeting it doesn't feel like a cold place you don't really know anything about the company or you're going into the offices of and all you've got is your deck and you're hoping the wind's blowing the right way and you're going to get the deal so doing a bit of research about the company in advance and maybe the individual helps and I say subconsciously even seeing the brand you're pitching to on screen as you research helps when you go into the reception and the brand logos there and everything you feel familiar so there's a bit of preparing mentally for the pitch the pitch itself most of the pitches we 
orchestrate and facilitate are usually 30 minutes. So a, a startup will get 30 minutes, maybe 45 if they're lucky with a brand person. And there's two types of pitches. One pitch is to investors, which is where it might be a demo day and you're pitching to an audience. That's completely different from being in a room where you're pitching to a brand person or a corporate. You have walls around you, you have some silence and you have some time to breathe, dare I say, and, and answer questions. If, like most of the pitches we ever see, it's in a room to a small group, it's important that you, I would argue, have five key things in your pitch, dependent upon whatever it is you're pitching for. But the most important things are, if you're going to talk about yourself and the product, identify who your audience is. That's quite important. Who your target audience is. What is the, the second one is what problem you are solving for the target audience. The third one, I'd say very important one, is how your product or service meets that and addresses that problem. The fourth one, which always comes up, is what is the USP? Because automatically people, I think I've seen this before, what is your USP is a fourth one. And the fifth one, which is a bit of the elephant in the room and takes a bit of orchestrating, is without being too punchy, talk about how the next step could look for you and that potential client. And in that, mention pricing if you can. So you could say, look, usually at this stage we do a pilot. This is our pilot proposal. It could be 20K over a 10-week pilot. You get this for it. And, and that's what we do with some, some clients. It's not saying they have to do it, but it just gives the recipient an idea of what a potential next step would be. And dare I say, pricing is something that everyone scurries around and doesn't bring up on both sides because it could ruin everything. So both sides don't want to talk about it. Um, so if you can bring it out in the open and say, look, the pricing could be for a pilot 20K or, or something like that, it just gets it out on the table. So I would say the pitch needs to concentrate on those five slides. I'm not saying it has to be five slides, but include those five areas. And the important thing is just try and remember that a pitch isn't just a pitch. And what I mean by that is if you've got 30 minutes with someone and you're pitching, don't spend a whole 30 minutes pitching because I always say the Q&A afterwards, the discussion afterwards is more important than the pitch. And it's a little bit of a controversial view, but I've seen a lot of great pitches ruined and not getting anywhere because there's no time for questions or the prep hasn't been put in for the questions and they don't get what they deserve. So we, as you can imagine, Rebecca, sit before, say, five or six startups present to one of our clients. I have a view as to I think technically wise, technical service should get the, the job, the pilot. 99% of the time they don't. And it's because half the time it's just because they over pitch or they don't leave the time for Q&As or when there are questions, they haven't prepped the answers. So the Q&A is as important as a pitch. Q&A is where the person receiving the information, let's say the brand person, is trying to get clarity, but also deep down trying to work out in their head whether they could work with you and the service or product you're offering. And with most marketing people, they're quite slick at presenting themselves. So they're used to slick presentations. If you're going to be very good in marketing, you've got to, to present internally, externally. So a good pitch helps, but their bar's quite high in their mind because they're used to pitching as part of their or presenting as part of their day job, should we say. So the pitch is important, but leave that time to build that relationship with a QA. and a And that's as important as sometimes that gets forgotten. Yeah, I agree. Have you been reading my blog? Is that uh, a similar, going down a similar Oh, line? I'm always on and on about making sure that whatever you're saying and doing is customer centric. Yes. You need to be thinking ahead about what the customer is going to be asking, what they need, what you're bringing to the table for them. Yeah. I would say in the top five issues that I see with prop tech startups, maybe the top one, is in terms of their messaging and how they present themselves, whether it's on their website, socials, in conversation, mm. it's me. I get it. You have a really cool thing going on and you want to tell people about it. I am not casting aspersions. I'm not making character judgments. I'm just saying when you talk all about yourself and how great you are and how cool your product is and all your tech stack and how awesome your team is and here are your people and here are their backgrounds you're not talking about the customer the more you're talking about yourself the less they are getting that from the conversation that they can go away and work with yeah. and truly if you can make them the center of the conversation their needs and of course how you're addressing those needs right yes. that's where you come in your relevance is only about what you're doing for them yeah. If you can have that conversation and leave space for lots of questions because they're going to have them, mm. if you can address 
any concerns that they might have up front. Pricing is always a key one. And also time. It's not just about investing money. It's about investing time in a solution. Are they going to need three months to implement your solution? And what would that look like? Is it worth their while? Really understanding, sorry, helping them to understand from their point of view what they need to bring to the table, what you're going to give them in return is just the number one core thing that gets missed a lot of time. And I think I'm being general here, but I think sometimes I've seen quite a few startups and i appreciate it you know i pitch for new business as well so we all pitch for new business but yep, same. Not, yeah we all do it but i think i've seen a lot of startups also go through a phase where the pitch is going really well they're getting the nods around the table and they've got two or three slides left and if they just keep to those two or three slides in that time they've done the best they can leading into 15 minutes of q a but it's almost like they get very comfortable and they decide that now's the time to throw some extra things into the pitch and carry on talking about things and i've seen some actually come out the pitch deck and get another deck up and say this is what else we do and i think it and, I, and I, don't get me wrong i can fully understand how that happens because you're on a flow people are on a roll should we say people are nodding their head and you want to just impress even more but the danger is without going around again on it but the more time you eat into the q a allocated time the less chance that you're going to get the work at the end of the day that's as clear as it is and and I just sometimes see that. For example, when you're pitching for corporates and brands, I would say generally they don't need to know who your team are. They definitely don't need to know about your investment. They don't need to know about your journey. If they ask, you can tell them, but don't waste two minutes talking about how you're mm -hmm. deciding to come up with this and don't throw the team up and don't talk about investment. So things like that are relevant if asked, but not relevant in a pitch to a corporation or a brand because there is a danger with all due respect to, to brand people that if you overkill what you're doing and how intelligent you are and how intelligent the team are the brand person thinks well i'm not this person they're a little bit they might feel a bit threatened in a bizarre way so just keep it to the product and keep it to how it can benefit them and and that's the best you can do i always say at the end of a pitch leading into the questions if someone on the other side of the table understands the product understands how you could help them that's the best you can do and that doesn't guarantee anything but it's the best you can do and that leads them hopefully with a bit of intrigue and curiosity to ask you questions which hopefully reinforce the positives and then they hopefully go away and make the right decisions you just got to leave if you do a pitch and at the end of it people still don't get the product you're going to waste 15 minutes q a where they're going to ask you questions to try and understand the product and at the end they still have questions after that but there's no time so less is more i say with a pitch yeah agreed I would love to know a bit more about what you do on a practical day-to-day -day level working with these startups and I would also like to know in light of that what are some of the common issues that you're seeing as you're working with these startups so the, the normal day for me is I, I I don't know what term I'd give myself I'm a bit like a connector or a matchmaker in the middle so my normal day is i'd have one or two briefs going for a client it could either be we have a meeting with a client to go through their brief and that could be an hour and a half to really understand what they're looking for and also as importantly to understand what is in scope and definitely what is out of scope so we could have a brief we've got one later today with a client where we're going to go through a brief and we just want to ascertain exactly what they're looking for so we're all aligned up front before we start searching so part of my day is talking to clients about a brief Part of my day can sometimes be um, having two, two and a half hour sessions with the client where we go through our findings. But the bulk of my day, I would say, is usually chatting to startups. I've got about three or four calls on today with startups where I'm going through two briefs. So it's three startups on one brief and another startup to another brief, understanding what they do, explaining to them the opportunity and trying to work out one what they do, because I've got to relay that back to the client, but also whether they are right for the brief and and most importantly whether they feel they're right for the brief as well not just my decision so mm. it's chatting to startups chatting to clients there's always bits and pieces I, I do quite a lot of mentoring so i usually have two or three mentor sessions in a week where i'm talking to startups that i just mentor to help with their business and dare i say there's always things around as i mentioned before with a book the book had its own life it goes and finds things and people get in touch so i'm generally doing bits and pieces around the book as well i'm usually on a phone usually i'd say two days a week at home where i am now and three days a week in london and i'm finding myself now going out a bit more outside which is really great getting outside of london i'm doing a few talks in universities around the books so i'm out and about but the common denominator is i'm generally chatting to people face to face or on the phone all day 
and then I need a break at the end of the day after that. But that, yeah, that's I bet. It. That's a lot. I find I do a lot of similar sort of, yeah, talking to people yeah. on online sometimes for a number of hours, depending on where they're at and what their needs are. It's very interesting, the introvert versus extrovert dichotomy there, because some people get loads of energy from talking to people and some people feel drained after talking to other people and there's no good or bad in that it's just people are different and you can assume when you meet someone who's outgoing and opinionated and warm and open that they are necessarily an extrovert but actually they might be more introverted naturally and need that quiet downtime to recharge yeah no i fully agree i'm i think I, mean, I, I don't believe there is a hundred percent extrovert, a hundred percent introvert. I think we all mix with the two, mm. and kind of the and I'm not an expert on this subject, but from what I understand, if you get energy from talking to people, or from, if you get energy from other people, then you're more extrovert. Well, that's an extrovert side, but if you get energy from yourself and um, being on your own sometimes, then that means you're that's the introvert side. I'm definitely more the extrovert side. I'm not a madman going out chatting to everyone I bump into, but I think COVID, to be candid. Was quite tough because i can talk to screens and we can that's fantastic but to a point i have to go out and chat to people so there were certain months during lockdown where i think i was almost like a dog i had to go out for a walk on my own just to get some space and and hopefully chat to someone be it so many meters away it was i think it was quite tough in a way obviously it was a pandemic so it was very tough for it, it wasn't mm. just a, a normal thing it was a huge experience but i think yeah for introvert extrovert i rear more on the extrovert but at the same time i can we're used now to working from home all day and having conversations. But if it was up to me, I would say I get more from a face-to-face -face generally than I do from Zoom. But thank God for technology, because if we didn't have technology, it would be phone calls all the time and, yeah. and not seeing people now. Yeah, So and but you know, linking that to founders, I, I think some of the best founders I've known are more introvert. And I think there's more, there is a myth sometimes that you have to be quite extrovert and outgoing to be a very successful business person. I really don't buy into that. I know a lot of people who naturally an introvert they can to the best of their abilities they're not comfortable sometimes but they can do a really good presentation and pitch and hold their own they couldn't do that all day back to back but when needed they you would think they're more stereotypically extrovert but they're not where sometimes extrovert people extremely extrovert people can sometimes be quite annoying i know people who <laughs> can't, help but can't help but pitch i know a couple of people who wherever they are will pitch it's like a pitch button goes on and that's the way they are. They and I don't know if that means they're extrovert or slightly mad or whatever, but they are maybe both. But they are really, and it, it gets there's no need to pitch now. So yeah, we just went for an Andos. Do I need to have this conversation yeah. again? <laughs> it is really weird. It's like they have a deck on them all the time. But but no, it's I think intro extra. I think that's what makes it interesting. You meet lots. I, in my case, I meet lots of people, different people, and and that's part of it. And I think which is part of the fun of what I find enjoyable, what I do. And I think yeah. your second question was more around startups, wasn't it? I, I yeah, this. what the specific mistakes might be a bit harsh, but that's fine. Mistakes is fine. Or perhaps the things that startups aren't doing quite so well, things that you see as common issues with startups. I think outside of the ones we've mentioned about over pitching and maybe not doing the research behind the before the breed for so before the pitch and we've all got gaps i'm not saying anyone's perfect but i think if there's a couple of things that come out with startups that i see quite a bit is once you there is a kind of a jump in the gun a bit so if i go to a startup for the first time and i talk to them and say i've got a brief now from mercedes mm -hmm. a lot of startups will think this could be it this could be the million pound ticket and if i get this is going to change everything and, and don't get me wrong, that could happen, but it won't happen with the brief I'm working on. No, no company, however risk-taking, how comfortable they're taking risk they are, they're not going to jump in with a company they've ever met before, people they've met before, and do a million pound plus deal with them. There is a little bit sometimes with startups where they see the brand and they lose a bit of their pragmatic side of their brain. And they think this is going to be it. This is going to be what I've waited for. Mm -hmm. So I, there is a, a little bit of a step back and see the bigger picture sometimes is a bit of a gap for startups especially when you're talking about big brands and i also think with that sometimes when they do get the pilot be it for a smaller amount of money some startups need a bit more patience when it comes to working through that pilot with the brand because brand people corporate people per se are very busy unless their job requires them to work with loads of startups they've got other things on their plate and they don't move as quickly as 
maybe definitely as smaller startup scale up companies do. And there's a bit of sometimes frustration and an impatience from a startup. And I always say, look, show some empathy towards the, the brand person or the corporate person and within reason, but show some empathy and they will thank you for that, mm. for being understanding. And that will give you the best chance you can. If that pilot works, you will get more work. If you start rattling people's cages early on saying you're five days late with this, what's happening, <clears throat> all you're doing is giving them more reason in their head to make the decision and know irrespective of what happens in that pilot. And I've seen some really good pilots where all the KPIs are here, but the startup concern doesn't get the work afterwards, the ability to get more work with that corporate, because I think they didn't manage that relationship with the corporate world. They started to become a high maintenance startup to work with. Now, mm -hmm. the, the corporation, unless we ask that feedback, is never going to tell us that, but I can just sense that's what's happened. So yeah. a little bit more standing back, seeing if, yes, you could earn loads of money with some of these companies, but maybe just thinking that's five, six, seven steps down the line, but be quite pragmatic. See the pilot as a maybe a Trojan horse in a way to get into a large company and be patient and show some empathy and show that you're almost, you've worked with big companies before, you understand their strains and their pressures and how things don't move so quickly. The more you can give that perception across, the more chance you've got that when the decision needs to be made, whether they carry on with you, that decision will work for you or not. So yeah. they're the I say bigger picture sometimes and a bit of patience when you're actually working with that that corporation, be it on a pilot, just a little bit of someone said, I think it was the someone from PG said that when you work with a when a startup works with a large company, it's like dance dancing with an elephant. And <laughs> it takes a little bit of time to get the rhythm. But then mm -hmm. once you get the rhythm, it's fine. And there's a bit of the music and it's that is i think quite a nice way of looking at it so it's a pretty and that's our job if we're in the middle we try and manage both sides but i, I see that quite a bit it's don't see the lights and the big lights and the big check straight mm -hmm. away you are working with them appreciate they, they live in a different world to you yeah i once was working with a startup who got the opportunity to pitch to apple wow. and their eyes just changed overnight to just Apple logos. All they could see was Apple. And we were based in London. They had to fly over to California to do this pitch. And this company had about 20 employees. Mm. So not early stage startup, but still relatively young. And the entire business, everyone dropped everything for yeah. this. Mm. We were in the office till... 12, one, two, working on this stuff. And the CEO would wake up the next morning at five o'clock and go, I've just had a thought, we actually need to change everything. And so we change everything. And then it, as the closer we got to this pitch date in California, the crazier everyone became to the point where my line manager was <laughs> buying me bunches of flowers and boxes of chocolates by way of apology for <laughs> all the late nights. That's how crazy it was. They became so completely obsessed with this Apple pitch that they lost staff, mm -hmm. they lost customers, mm -hmm. and they didn't win the pitch. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. and I told them enterprise sales in general, you're already looking at 18, 24 month sales cycles. As average, you might do better than that. That'd be great. But if you're a startup with a runway of 12 months, yeah. what you can't afford to lose customers and people over a pitch to a corporate, you need to be enterprise ready. If you're going to go into enterprise, great. I'm all for it. I think it's brilliant. But if you're not there yet, if your product isn't there, if you don't have the bandwidth to do the pitch, if it's too high of a risk in terms of your runway, you need to just stop and think and talk to someone like Ken, get some advice and make sure that you're ready and know what you're doing and what you're offering. I think it also has a, 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 a halo effect as well. So if I know some startups who have had similar situations where they've got a, an opportunity to pitch to a, a very large company, mm -hmm. and as well as all the, the demands, some self-inflicted pressure they put on themselves, like, like you were saying with your experience with Apple, they also talk about it outside of their work spheres as well. So they talk to people in the friends and family. I've got a, in this case, it could be I've got a presentation in the States with Apple and their friends and family know about it. So all of a sudden, the stakes are so high mm -hmm. in this person's own personal business and personal ecosystem that 
there's more pressure they're putting themselves to succeed. So what happens, I've seen a lot is, and this is not Apple, but startups have pitched to a, a corporate outside. I'm not saying we guarantee anything, but outside of us, I know of startups who have pitched to corporates and they've told everyone about this pitch coming up. So everyone's, wow, you've got this pitch with Coca-Cola and whatever it is. It's amazing. It's going to be, so it's got this pitch and it's next week. And then what sometimes happens is that the client, the, or not client, this isn't a client one, but the corporate doesn't get back. So the startup when they meet the family again, the family say, how's it going with Coke? I haven't heard yet. And it's only so long you can say I haven't heard yet. And But I still see some startups, not so much now, but when I started presenting their creds deck and having a logo, say Coke, on their deck, and I would say, oh, did you hear from Coke? Oh, no, I haven't, but they haven't said no. And I think that was about seven or eight months ago. And it sounds bizarre, but it's the, so I think some of that is just not accepting it's a no, mm-hmm. which we tell other people it's a no. And maybe this is just an, an extreme example, but I do think that happens. People do sometimes get blinded by the lights and they don't see it as a, it's a business thing you've got to do. It's not like a, it's not going to change your life overnight. And they, they run before they can walk and they just jump the gun or whatever, you know, we want to put to it. And it just feels, it's a shame because you put so much more pressure on yourself. I also feel mm-hmm. if you're going to go pitch someone quite big, but you're not quite sure what they want, because that sometimes happens. Come and talk to our innovation team. You think, oh my goodness, do we really go harder with a proposal here? But that may not be what they want. So I always say in that situation, go in with your, this is what we do, this is the problem we're solving, this is why we're different, this is how it works. And then dare I say again, without saying like a scratch record, leave the time for questions and answers so you can shape your proposal verbally after that pitch. Mm-hmm. And I would much rather go into a meeting where I had five minutes to pitch and 45 minutes to chat than I would the other way around because that chatting, the Q&A, can sometimes take your pitch to the next level verbally and you can make it much more personalized based on what you're hearing from their questions and all of a sudden you're even though your products not changed you've had a very you, you left the meeting with a very personalized offer in their minds because you've shaped that offer as you chat with them after the pitch rather than just spending the whole time pitching and then they say oh, that's not what we want we're looking for you to do this but it's too late now. i've run out of time you think, oh. so it goes back to that Q&A thing, really. You can, I think there's a bit of flexibility if you allow time for question and answer. You can shape your proposal a bit verbally. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it is a lot of pressure, and I understand that, and we all get excited by big meetings. You don't want really to put too much pressure on yourself because there's enough pressure as it is. Agreed. That's excellent advice. Thank you so much for that, Ken. Was there anything else that you wanted to cover or chat about or ask me about? No, it's been fantastic. It's been great to have a chat about what I do to find out more about yourself. I will read your blog. <laughs> you can if you want. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and if anyone wants to reach out, I'm on LinkedIn. So if anyone wants to connect up, I'm more than happy to, to meet up with people and discuss if they've got any questions over pitches or if there's a, a pitch coming up. Just connect up on, on LinkedIn. If I have. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us on the PropTech Growth Podcast. To learn more, you can find us on LinkedIn or email proptechpodcast at iCloud.com. See you next time.